Uh, as you can see from this structure, we have in a way three three short present three presentations by uh, uh, one each. But in a way, it's 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 two parts, not three parts really, because there's a first part that I will do that is more general about uh, what what we can learn from existing evidence on innovation policy impact that is based on a recent study we've done. It's a, just some reflection on how to use existing evidence and what it means. And the second one is, is two part, but it's about the same thing. It's about performance based research funding systems. Uh, and we are starting with a concrete example of the UK and then in a way zooming out and looking also at other country examples and having some more general considerations as regards PRFS. So we have, uh, we have in a way two parts. I'm doing the first part on policy learning and, uh, and innovation policy. Um, so the main argument is that when we look at existing evidence and then we look at uh, evidence production, there are certain things we have to take into consideration in order to draw conclusions from this evidence. Now, we all know that evidence is limited and so on, but because we have done a study that is based on synthesizing evidence we have on innovation policy impact, uh, some of the things really struck us and we thought we have to, in a way, debate these kind of things uh, in order to, to, to allow policy learning to improve. Um, so it's about how can we learn in innovation policy based on, on evidence. Now we know the limits of, of learning. There are all kinds of reasons why we have limits in, in, in learning. Uh, the literature knows a lot about uh, capacity barriers. So individuals, of course, have the bounded rationality. They have time constraints and resource constraints. They have certain normative filters. They want to see the world uh, as they have preconceived it, and that's how they interpret data and so on. We have also organizational uh, 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 constraints, so that when you, when you work in a certain institutional environment, in an organization, there are certain ways you interpret data because you have organizational filters, organizational strategies. And then, of course, innovation policy that have a very heterogeneous landscape of actors and organizations, and instruments are connected to different actors. Therefore, uh, these institutional constraints are multiplied. So who learns what then it becomes an issue. We, we know about these things and there's literature about this and we have to take it into consideration. And also, of course, learning is only one part of the big picture of policy change. So there's a lot of politics when it comes to changing programs, changing policies and strategies and so on. And there are costs involved in changing. So how you interpret certain data has also to do with what, uh, what your opportunities are at a given point in time in the political process and what your resources are in order to do so. So there are limitations in taking lessons into account in your, in, in, in your policy development. Did you check your fingers? Oh, sorry. Well, oh. Sorry. Uh, uh, so I'm, I'm running through this slide. So we have capacities. Um, Capacity barriers, and we have barriers in terms of, of, of the taking action out of, out, of what, out of what we learn. And we know about these barriers, but by looking at, all the, at a lot of evidence in innovation policy, we have, we have also realized that, they, that there, are, um, there are a lot of issues around quality and usefulness of existing evidence itself. So it is the evidence that we have that may actually produce some limitations of, of how we can learn from, from uh, evaluation and, and evidence making. So that is now what I want to focus. I want to focus on the last point on this slide, on um, the quality of, of evidence and what it means for using evidence for policy making, for learning. Uh, the, the background here, and Sergio and colleagues know that very well, the background has been a, a study we've done for Nesta um, two years ago now, or one, one and a half years ago, uh, the results of which will now be published very, very soon in a, in a book, but they are already published on the web, and I've indicated the web page here. Uh, it is, in a, in a way, an, an analysis of the lessons learned out of existing studies, existing articles in, in peer-reviewed journals, existing evaluations, grey literature, everything we could find and everything that passed a certain quality threshold, we analysed. Uh, that was about innovation policy, not science policy. Uh, so it was not an analysis of, of, of specific countries, 
but it was trying to capture the breadth of innovation policy instruments and see what is the impact of these instruments and what can be learned from existing um, uh, evalu evaluation. You can see at the bottom of the slides what our data, data sources were. We had 200 evaluation reports and, and almost 600 academic an, an analysis. So um, we had a quite a substantial um, um, body of, of literature. Uh, this is the book that will come out soon. It is in print as we speak. Uh, it will be there in, in, in spring, and it, 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 it brings together main results of that exercise. Now, the next, uh, the next um, two or three slides can be done very quickly, just to illustrate um, what, what we mean when we talk about innovation policy. First of all, the definition is a very broad one. So it's a public intervention to support the generation and the diffusion of new products, processes, or uh, services. So it is not only the generation of innovation, it's also the diffusion of innovation, it's also the, the uptake of, of uh, innovation. And it's not only about you know, radically new products, it's also new to the buyer and new to the firm. So it's a very broad approach in terms of you know, innovation, uh, innovation policy. And some of the policies we looked at were actually not officially labeled within the innovation policy uh, 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 remit, but uh, were, were in, in other policies like energy policy, uh, transport policy, and so on, but had, of course, an in, in innovation, innovation angle. Um, we, we don't go through that one. That is the typology of instrument, and those of you who have worked innovation policy will recognize many of those. Um, that, that is the way we have, in a way, divided the world out there in terms of instruments. Uh, we have uh, organized the, these various policies according to policy goals, uh, and, and, and the first cut was between supply instruments, instruments that support mainly those that generate innovation, and demand instruments, instruments that mainly uh, somehow influence and support those that, that take up uh, innovation, and buy and use them. And then we have the device, uh, a typology of goals, innovation policy goals. We don't have to, to go into that detail. It, it will all be in the handbook. It's all on the web, but that is in a way that is our world. So on the left, you see all the reports we've done on individual instruments. So what, what I'm talking from now on is not referring to one specific instrument. It's just an overall impression from our analysis of the existing evidence on impact of all of these instruments. So the first lesson, I have three lessons. Uh, of course, we simplify. There are many, many small lessons, many, many things we could discuss in terms of methodology. But overarching lessons when, when reflecting about, about the evidence we have. Um, evaluations, evidence making, and interpreting it should take more care with the underlying rationales and with the appropriateness, the analysis of appropriateness of, of instruments. Um, many analyses that we have take certain positions, certain rationales or paradigmatic positions as given. So we all know about market failures. Often we, we, we read about system failures. Then there's about uh, improving framework conditions. And then some analysis refer to policies that, that are about directing innovations towards, towards certain society preferences and goals. Um, very often we, hear, we, we read these rationales, but there's very little reflection about them. There's often, yeah, they are taken for granted. They are not really problematized, and they are not linked with our, with our in, uh, to the instrument. We don't really quite know how the instrument actually um, links to that rationale, what the real rationale for that instrument is, because these, these terms, market system failures, are, of course, umbrella terms. And we have to understand what it really means for a given situation and a given instrument. Very often in our analysis, we simply hear that, or we read that an instrument tackles market failures, or tackles system failures without giving us a, a clear understanding of what the of what that re uh, uh, really means. Also, a lot of analysis, and that is a limitation in my view, um, seem to have the assumption that more innovation uh, is good. So, so while policy instruments very often are done not only to improve conditions for innovation, but also to reach, to achieve other goals with more innovation and better innovation, we, we, we often have in, uh, evaluations and, and, other, and other studies only looking at the, you know, what happens in terms of innovation, more innovation, more input, more output innovation, but not what that really, uh, really means. And that is all often linked to a lack of analysis of what the underlying problem is, why certain interventions are needed, 
in terms of producing more and better innovation and what that actually means in a given context. So rationales and appropriateness are often mentioned, but they are too often not really uh, analyzed, uh, part of the analysis, which then of course has means we have a limitation in, in generalizing and interpreting this. Uh, to come to my second uh, lesson, I need to have one intermediate slide, which is very much reflecting the discussion definitely in the UK, in Europe, but certainly in the UK. It's a discussion about trying to, uh, to use existing evidence very instrumentally. So in a way, what really matters in terms of innovation policy is what works. So the idea for our study was born in the Department of Business in, uh, Innovation and Skills, where the minister said, wouldn't it be nice to know what works on the basis of existing evidence? So, so there, was a, there, there, is now, there has been in the UK an, an, an evidence movement contra controversy, as I call it. So people out there saying, oh, what, what matters in terms of policymaking is what works. This implies that we know what works. We can generalize what works uh, beyond, beyond context. So the assumptions on evidence and knowledge are at the beginning and at one end of this spectrum of this controversy has been, well, uh, knowledge that we find, that, 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 we, that we define in these evaluations is, is objective. It can be, it's replicable, it's, it's, it's systemic, it's systematic, it's explicit, ideally it's quantifiable, it's generalizable, generalizable and we can draw in a way conclusions as to what best practice is. It's what we, we call external validity. There are, we can, we, can, we can identify what, what works on the basis of, of, of objective, objective data. Uh, we then had a, have a bit of, an, of, a, of a softening of that approach um, where, where theory comes in, where, where we say, well, we, uh, to, in order to understand um, the effects of an intervention, we, we, we can't not, not only look at some kind of outcome and output that we identify and quantify, we have to understand the way in which that output and outcome is actually achieved, or yeah, that, that, that's what, what, what theory-based theory evaluation means. So we have intervention logic, and we have a clear mechanism, understanding of how the intervention uh, affects certain components and how the, the change of behavior of those components then affects uh, immediate outputs and intermediary outcomes and final outcomes impact and, uh, and, and so on. So we have implementation chains, uh, but it still is generalizable. We have uh, similar types of interventions that have similar types of intervention logics, and we can then say, well, we have intervention logic of type A, B, or C, and we can generalize for, for instruments of that in a way of, 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 of that type. So the expectation is that, um, that we can reduce ambiguity by, 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 using, by, by using these kind of approaches, and then we can therefore improve the instrumental use of, of evaluation. We can generalize what, what we find. By, by using theory-based interventions. Now, um, I would question that a little bit. I would at least caution it a little bit and say, well, we have, we have to be aware of, of, of the limitation of, of this external val validity of evaluation. Uh, I, when, we, when, when we came to our conclusions based on our reading of the material, I think we created a bit of frustration with our client, uh, which was a foundation in London, and also with, with some people in, in agencies and ministries, because they wanted to know what works. They wanted us to tell them, uh, okay, for, for, certain for, for, for a certain problem, just uh, these, these interventions work and others work, work better, others work, work worse. And we always said, well, it, it depends because the external validity is limited. Results are often not generalizable for all kinds of reasons. It's, we have different context conditions. We have different existing portfolios of instruments, a certain instrument A, of course, always explicitly, implicitly interacts with a whole portfolio of instruments and framework conditions in a certain country. So to transfer lessons of an instrument A to country B with a different instrument portfolio is highly, pro uh, highly problematic. We have different target groups. So in some countries, a certain, uh, a certain mechanism to improve capabilities of SMEs works nicely because you have a very different skill base, a very different way of, 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 being, of capabilities of innovation in SMEs in country A from country B. And it, across Europe, we have many examples where we transfer policies from Germany to Lithuania and wonder why they don't work. Um, so existing studies, sec a second point, often 
miss details of design and implementation. They look at the intervention theory and say, we have done certain things, that's what the program demands, and then we look at the outcome. And they, they often do not look at the details of how the design actually was, was executed and, and, and implemented. Therefore, to generalize uh, without looking at issues of implementation is a, is, a, is a real problem because programs change through implementation. Implementers have their own rationales, and then there are interactions with the target group, and all kinds of things happen within a program. So two, two, two programs that, that seem to do the same thing might end up doing very different things once they, we, we, we run through the implementation cycle. And we have a limit, limited reliability that is uh, based on, on method problems, operationalization problems. Uh, there, there are a couple of examples where we see the same kind of intervention, tax incentive in country A, has a huge input additionality in study A and a very little input additionality in study B, similar data, different regression models, different underlying assumptions, different results. So again, to generalize uh, across a multitude of studies is tricky if we have these kind of method bias. We also have limitations of operationalization. Often we talk about certain, certain issues, certain, certain effects like behavioral additionality, which is the change in behavior and attitudes of actors because of intervention. But in many studies, it is simply reduced to more cooperation. Uh, and, 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 and that, of course, is a severe limitation in understanding what behavior additionality really means and how can you then generalize a, a, across different uh, studies. And in many studies, and that's, again, an issue uh, of, of our methods, are, are relying very much on self-reporting. And there's a lack of triangulation, so the data is not really robust. So that is, that is a second issue. There are all kinds of reasons why we, ha we have to be careful in, in thinking we can generalize the results of, 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 of studies. We have to understand this issue. My third and last point, it is a bit, a bit related. It's we have to understand the possible trap of theory-based evaluation. Now, I just said that it is, of course, a necessity to understand the intervention logic of a program, to understand the theory behind it, to understand the various mechanisms by which the intervention finally achieves its, its, its final impact. And that, that is important, don't, don't get me wrong. But in many of the evaluations that we use to make sense of innovation policy impact, the intervention theory is very often too implicit. That's not so much true for the evaluation studies that are done by, by, by experts in the field, like, like, like Technopolis and, and, and Eric Arnold. If you look at these specialized agencies and their evaluations, they are very clear on these intervention logics. But if you look at all these academic studies that look at the effects of policies and try to uh, compare them, they often don't have intervention logic that are explicit and, and detailed enough, not articulated, not, not articulated properly. And then they have all kinds of, of, of conclusions that are not really based on what the program actually, actually does. In some interventions that we now also include in terms of broader innovation policy approaches, like looking at the innovation effects of skills and migration and so on, we lack an intervention theory altogether. We, 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 we try to define all kinds of effects of skills and migration policies without understanding the theoretically, the linkages between, between skills and, 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 and migration and innovation at the end. So, so we have a bit of an artificial effect almost without understanding mechanisms. A second point is that the theory-based approach has, a, has another problem, which is it can be self-limiting. You, you construct a nice, a nice theory, a nice logic chart, understanding how the intervention works, but then you stop thinking. You only look at, uh, at your little boxes in the logic chart. You only look at the data you can find uh, that, in a way, fit the theory, and then you try to interpret this. But of course, the theory is just an approximation of what's happening uh, with, with any model. Uh, and so, so, but we, we, we stop looking at, at, at other things that might influence what's happening, at other mechanisms. So we, and we, we don't look at unintended effects, uh, or even detrimental effects, effects that we don't want. We don't, they are not part of our models. Therefore, we don't, we, we, we don't, we, we don't uh, uh, do it. So we, in a way, while we should have a theory, we should always be critical in, in, in understanding what are the relative contributions of, of the program to all these building blocks of, this, of, of that model. And are there maybe alternative or complementary theories that, 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 that explain certain things that we observe? So we shouldn't be limited in our, in our, in our, uh, through our theory. And then 
we also, and that is that is actually a bit of a, a sad result, I, I must say. When we when we look at evaluations, um, we have very often not an operationalization of the various intervention steps. So people have intervention theories; they look at all the various steps, um, but then when they do the analysis many of the interim steps are not analyzed. So, so, so the intervention logic is not followed. There are, there are a lot of leaps and jumps. Uh, and, 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 and that is, of course, a big problem if you really under, want to understand how the program has, has its effect. So intervention logics are there, but they are not fully, fully operationalized. So the, that's my, my third lesson. We have to understand the, the, what it means to use in intervention theory. Um, this is just one example, uh, very quickly, that is policies on the demand side. That is something that I've worked on this comp compendium. So we have, a, we have a policy, let's say a demand subsidy or public procurement uh, initiative. Um, uh, but let's stick with the demand subsidy on where, where, where you target private consumers to buy, to buy an, 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 an innovation, to, to create a market for, for an innovative solution, let's say in the energy efficiency area. Uh, what this policy does, it wants to support, as I said in the middle, in this chart, innovation demand, the uptake and diffusion of the innovation. That then has two effects. One is it has societal benefits. We have less carbon emission. That's one societal benefit. We have cleaner cities, whatever it is. But the other effect is an indirect effect that we, through this kind of diffusion, we also trigger innovation-driven competition and it trigger even more innovation for the next generation. That is, in a way, the, the, the idea of many of these demand policies. But if we look at what, what evaluations we actually have, we have a lot of evaluations that, that look at the link between diffusion and innovation activities, the interrelationship between the two, a lot of econometric studies. We have a lot of studies that look at how the, the policy leads to innovation, but, uh, and innovation uh, diffusion, sorry. But we have very few that try to look at the whole package, that really try to understand the whole uh, the, the whole package of what a demand policy actually should do with the system in terms of societal benefit, diffusion, and innovation generation uh, capabilities. We have very little of those. So my conclusion, uh, learning barriers innovation policy not, has not only to do with individual capacity and organization capacity constraints, it also, also has to do with the nature and the use of the, of the evidence itself. Evidence, we know that, is only one input to learning. There are all kinds of other inputs for that influence policy uh, policy change. Um, effects are not determined. Uh, effects are determined by many non-instrument related factors. There are all kinds of issues around an instrument that that influence the effect of the instrument. Um, and and uh, if we understand that, then we are very suspicious of all these of all these headlines in terms of which innovation intervention makes more sense than uh, in, in a certain given situation, because these contexts, uh, contexts really, really do uh, uh, matter. Um, so, of course, we can use existing evidence. Of course, we should go on reading evaluation and even analysis, but we have to be aware of the limitations of, of, of this synthesizing uh, activity. That is my last, that is my last slide. So we should reduce this is what I call the scope and depth problem and the theory-based evaluation problem and context uh, uh, sensitive. We should have the full intervention logic and, and should operationalize the full intervention logic. Uh, and we should expand also the scope of the analysis and our reading of these things uh, to, to implementation as well. Each program, even if it looks the same, means a different thing because of the way it's implemented. Uh, so synthesizing existing evidence can help us a lot, uh, but we have to be aware of the dangers of, of this exercise of looking at existing evidence because of the, of the three reasons that I, that I mentioned. So that was my quick run through, three, um, through um, learning from existing evidence innovation policy. And um, as far as I understand, we, we go on with our second part of, of the um, or the presentation, and, and later we have then a, a general discussion about issues we've raised. Is that correct, Sergio? Yes, it's correct. Okay. But Sergio, can you try to, to reconnect us also, uh, like, through the audio? Anyway, so I now give, uh, give the floor, in a way, give the table to, to Kate, 
and we turn to something that is not really related to innovation, uh, not very directly at least, uh, but is I think of, of, of critical importance for uh, science and innovation systems, which is uh, the REF exercise. Hello, hello. Jakob, Jakob. Are you listening? Yeah, um, I'm going to say uh, a little bit about um, how the UK National Research Evaluation for Universities, um, how that works and uh, a little bit about how it's developed. Um, and here we go away from uh, any notion of um, program evaluation or innovation evaluation towards um, a, a system which has been quite influential and other countries have adopted some similar systems whereby um, research in universities is subject to uh, a national peer review in essence um, which not only gives um, uh, a quality indicator or a quality rating, but also for the UK uh, actually drives the funding formula. So this uh, is a very, a very interesting system. So um, we're going to relate it to the final part of our group presentation, uh, which is talking about um, performance related funding systems and we can say really that um, in the UK the um, REF or as it used to be called until the most recent version the research assessment exercise uh, was the really the first uh, established such um, evaluation system and um, it's been around in slightly different formats and it's grown um, in its, uh, the size of the effort. Um, it's grown from a relatively informal exercise um, at the end of the 1980s to a very serious and resource consuming exercise uh, in, in present times. So uh, in the UK, um, the universities are important um, performers of, um, of basic and applied research. Um, and in the UK, the institutional arrangement is that um, the universities uh, can have some uh, more like block grant, um, institutional block grant for their research. The funding of teaching is, is, is separated out and that's changed because we now have student fees. But what I'm talking about is uh, allocation of um, uh, block grants to the universities for their research funding, which is not um, tied to specific research projects because there are other funders, namely our research councils and major charities and industry and foundations which can support specific projects um, in uh, university research. So this is not project related. And there are some key elements to it uh, and one of the most important ones is that it is fundamentally uh, a, a very very large peer review exercise and it doesn't mean it it's it, it doesn't have some in information through um, indicators uh, but it's not based on uh, indicators uh, it's based on actual uh, peer review uh, through peer review panels in the normal way i'll return to some of these points in a minute but these are basic characteristics that are quite important to understand so it's allocating the money, it's a peer review, and the other, another important point is that um, the formula which is decided upon uh, in which the results of the peer review are entered to actually calculate how much uh, block funding each university gets, uh, the formula is designed specifically 
to concentrate that funding towards the highest performing uh, research departments and groups. It's not meant to be an allocation system which is um, uh, equitable or, or fairly giving out the money to all the universities. No, not at all. It was deliberately put in in order to uh, make sure that the, uh, the research groups that receive the highest marks in terms of their uh, judgment of quality, those research groups get the most money. And over the years of the R research assessment exercise and the REF, this formula for concentration has become steeper and steeper. So for the universities, it is very important for them to do well in it so that they can have access uh, to this funding. So the last quote on that slide, um, that refers to uh, a self-organised group of our um, research intensive universities, uh, which are, have also been very influential in how this peer review process is organised uh, so that they are, if you like, trying to protect their own interests uh, and not allowing um, too much of that research grant to be given away to uh, universities which are more teaching focused or have only small areas of uh, research um, excellence which can get the money. That's a slightly cynical quote, but uh, it's not without some truth. So, um, I think some of these points I've, I've already made. So there is um, a regularity to the review, but it's it's rather an elastic one. So we had the most recent one, the results were published at the end of last year, the 2014 exercise. Before then, the, the previous exercise was in 2008. And because the exercise has become more and more uh, costly to organise, and more elaborated, um, it tends to be the case that uh, the funding councils leave a longer period between each. Why is that important? Well, it's important because the results of each exercise um, set the funding formula for the next period, and that can be for quite a number of years. Um, the uh, exercise as a whole is used to drive the distribution of about two billion uh, British pounds per year. Um, so it is driving uh, quite a big, a big budget. And as I said, concentrating that to the highest performing groups, um, which means that if your groups in your university do not get a good outcome, then it means that they will not receive either any funding or very low levels of funding for the next uh, period, which can be quite a number of years to come. So it, it can have some quite serious um, implications for universities uh, if they have um, funding uh, reducing uh, over the next period. Um, so, uh, I mentioned before uh, these universities called the Russell Group. We have um, in, the, in the REF 2014, there were 154 um, universities or higher education institutes, which might not actually be universities. So these might be, uh, for example, art schools, um, agricultural um, colleges, things like that. Out of the 154, um, the concentration is uh, to around the, perhaps the top, uh, the top 20 performing with quite a skew towards the ones at the very uh, top of, of the ranking. So uh, it, it is a system which um, skews the funding really quite strongly uh, towards a few institutions out of the uh, number of around 160 altogether um, in the UK. So that just reminds us that although we have this number of universities, it's really only a, a small number of them that are um, actively 
able to make use of this block funding for research, because the others don't really get very much. So I mentioned that um, it's, a, it's quite a, a costly and elaborate system, and because it's allocating public funding, it has to be seen to be operating in a fair way, um, in, uh, and, and everything has to be uh, properly um, defined and explained. Um, but the, the basic um, organisation is that uh, each um, research group, uh, when I say group, it's like an area, for example, it could be uh, something like uh, geography or business and management. So each area um, in the university uh, can nominate four publications per member of staff. And the peer review panels, their main job is to read and judge uh, the significance and rigour and originality of these research publications. Um, that's what they mainly are. There is also some marks given to something called research environment, which really means a statement on research strategy. And here is where some indicators come in and statistics, so around grants, uh, grant income, uh, PhDs, a number of PhDs completed, these kinds of things. And some panels did use or have used evidence from citations uh, to inform their judgment of the quality of the publications. Now, what's interesting about our national exercise is, is how it's changed over the years. And... Um, this year, this latest round, um, was really quite substantially different because not only were the publications reviewed in the, in the normal way of peer review, uh, but um, the impacts of research were also actually judged. And these were judged according to the terms of the reach of the impact, so how widespread was the impact and the significance of the impact, so how important was this impact from research to the economy or to people's lives, um, uh, this kind of thing. And the universities uh, were asked to um, prepare little case studies of the impact of their research. And I have to say this um, uh, caused um, a, a lot of activity uh, within the universities uh, in, sorry, in preparing these. So this is quite an interesting uh, development. So why, why, does, uh, why, did, why was this element added? Well, it was added really in response to um, uh, concerns from uh, a political level and the ministry level that uh, our research in the UK um, has to be funded on the basis that it is an investment that will bring about returns for our economy and society. And it's not enough for universities to say that um, their work is excellent. It, it also uh, has, to, has to show this um, impact, uh, broader impact. So the cases have to be written and they're all available on the website, they're all in the public domain but they had to be traceable to an actual piece of research. Um, and universities also had to explain how they manage their impact. So, for example, do they give members of staff time to uh, engage with users, to, to uh, take their research results further? Um, and this could be in any any sort of dimension. It, it was not certainly it's not restricted to the research having economic or business impacts. It can be in a wide variety of dimensions, but it has to be related to research. So you couldn't speak about your staff's work with education, for example, unless it was related to some specific research that those uh, staff members had published. So with the REF uh, just finishing, um, what's, what are the effects of it? Well, uh, for the RAE, that's been going for, for much longer. There are various studies and pieces of evidence about 
some of its effects. And some of them are really um, attributable to the fact that the whole exercise is a peer review and peer review generally is not very well able to cope with multidisciplinary research, research that's different or very novel. Um, and so it tends to give us quite a stable outcome. And uh, certainly um, there, were, there are periodic demands to stop doing this exercise and just rely on, for example, grant performance bibliometric performance uh, and lots of studies done about whether this would give uh, the, the same result. Um, nevertheless, we're still carrying on with it despite the high, debatably high costs. It's quite difficult to work out how much it does cost. You're interested in the impacts of evaluation and the effects on the REF. Again, it's a bit early to say, but generally, um, the anecdotal evidence is that there's a huge focus now within the universities and in, on academic careers on building impact into research, getting recognition for having a research that has impact uh, on the one hand, but also an increasing focus on the ranking of your journal uh, and the quality of, of your research outputs. Um, as opposed uh, to the quantity, which in some systems is emphasised. So um, that's just a few, really, a few key points about our UK system. And I'm going to hand over now to uh, Eric Arnold. And, and what he's going to do is just step back a bit and uh, think about um, the uh, notion of performance-related funding systems um, a bit more broadly and also um, to let us see some uh, developments and practices in other countries. <clears throat> 